Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Project Clear Constellation's State of Space Roundtable. My name is Dan Sampson, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Rubicon. I'm your moderator for this event, and I'm thankful to all of you for joining us today. Our virtual roundtable series features conversations with space industry experts in an intimate setting curated exclusively for our Project Clear Constellation community. But before we dive into the, today's discussion, a brief word on Rubicon and who we are. Um, as a company, our mission is simple, and that is to end waste. You likely only know our name in the context of Project Clear Constellation, but day to day, Rubicon is a digital marketplace for waste and recycling and provider of software-based solutions to businesses and governments worldwide. We use technology to drive environmental innovation and help turn businesses into sustainable enterprises and neighborhoods into greener and smarter places to live and work. Rubicon is able to find solutions uh, for almost every waste stream imaginable. So it's only fitting that we have set our sights on space debris as our next frontier. We believe it's important for adjacent industries and non-traditional partners like Rubicon to drive awareness of the critical growing problem of space debris and to work alongside the space industry to help find a solution. That is why we at Rubicon are so proud to help lead this charge and host a first of its kind competition in Project Clear Constellation. We will reward creativity and innovation through design concepts that students from across the United States, just like all of you, will submit to address the issue of space debris. With all of that said, I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Charity Whedon of AstroScale. AstroScale provides satellite life extension and other on-orbit services for commercial operators, the United States government, and partner governments around the world. The company has been an incredible partner to our competition, and we are grateful that Nobu Okada, founder and CEO of AstroScale, is serving as a clear constellation judge. Charity is a visionary within the space community, and serves as the Vice President of Global Space Policy and Government Affairs for AstroScale US. In this role, she coordinates the company's global policy efforts towards spaceflight safety in order to achieve long-term space sustainability. Charity also chairs the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Say that quickly three times. And she serves as a fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, an advisory board member of VIA Satellite, and a mentor for the Brooke Owens Fellowship. All of that in addition to her 23 years of service in the Royal Canadian Air Force. So to help us all understand the current state of space, Charity will give an insider's perspective on what's in store for the space industry and for US space policy in 2022 and beyond. One quick housekeeping item, we are reserving some time for Q&A at the end of today's session. So please send in any questions you have for Charity using the Q&A box towards the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many as we can. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Charity, and thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, very, very much thanks to the wonderful introduction. Really appreciate that. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm excited today to talk to you about the, spate, the state of space. So I feel like this is an inaugural address, and maybe we should do this every year because the state of space is <laughs> congested, but full of potential. And I'll get into why that is uh, later on in the presentation. Nothing is more exciting than to see the larger waste management, circular economy industries become engaged in this issue. And it affects every single person on this planet and off the planet, by the way. I wanna thank Rubicon for establishing the Clear Constellation program and to engage with young professionals and students who are the decision makers of tomorrow. That's you. So unfortunately, I can't see the slides, so I'm gonna ask for some help here, but we'll advance one to the second slide, please. So you should be seeing just the very basics of what is space debris. And uh, this is an important baseline to understand as we talk about this important issue. There's been over six decades of littering just above our heads. And it's not so far away, actually, when you think of it. 300, 400, 500 kilometers are very congested and, and full of orbits, full of uh, satellites orbiting Earth. So there's many things in orbit today that we consider space junk. These are spent upper stage rocket bodies. It's surprising to see that the large amount of a rocket is, is mainly 
just space junk at the end of the day. And that little, little bit cone on the top, that's where you keep the payload. So it takes a lot of fuel, a lot of energy to get into space. And these unfortunately are left up in orbit. Uh, some of them come down quickly and others stay in orbit for long term. Of course, when you deploy a satellite or you just do a, a spacewalk in space, sometimes you have to release some objects during normal operations. And this is accumulated as well. And of course, if you deploy satellites, they don't last forever in space. Space is a harsh environment. So there are plenty of satellites that have been launched in space. They've stayed there after end of mission, and they're slowly finding their way back into the atmosphere to burn up, but it's a slow ride. Last but not least, and the thing we want to prevent are on-orbit fragmentations or breakups. And this is where large pieces of debris collide with each other, or sometimes large pieces of debris or satellites um, break up in orbit as well due to extra energy inside the defunct satellite. So six decades of this, around 10,000 launches uh, have gone into space. You can imagine the type of pollution and litter littering that has been accumulating. So why do we care? It's up there, right? Space is big. Well, we have to care because we rely heavily on space for our daily lives and for society to run normal as usual. So finance systems rely on timing signals from space. Your weather report relies on weather, uh, satellite uh, that detects weather patterns and climate, especially important for our climate emergency. Just daily communications, a lot of uh, folks require satellite-based internet because they don't live close to a city and they don't have the ability to have, you know, T1 lines and fiber come to, right to their door. Disaster response. Have you ever gone hiking and you have one of those neat radios? Guess what? If you get into trouble, space is there to save you. So those signals go through a, a satellite and rescuers will be on your way. Many, many countless reasons why we need to care about space. Space is, even though it's up there, is as much down here on Earth every day for us. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, as I alluded to, our orbits are already getting congested with pieces of debris. And let's think about it. When you're orbiting Earth at some orbits, it's going really fast orbiting going around around 17,000 miles an hour. Even something the size of a blueberry is gonna do a lot of damage. Unfortunately, we cannot track blueberries in space, not yet. And that's a problem because between one and 10 centimeters, I'm going metric here when you're in the space business, one and 10 centimeters, we call those lethal non-trackable pieces of debris. You can't track them, you don't know where they are, and they might damage or destroy your satellite or, uh, God forbid, uh, human space exploration as well if one hits you. So we've been populating the low Earth orbit, which is approximately 100 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. And then there's a middle Earth orbit, which is around the 12,000 to 20,000 kilometer range. That's where all your GPS lives. And then way out there at 24,000, 36,000 kilometers rather, are the is the geostationary belt. And if you can think about the Earth's rotation, the geostationary belt rotates with the Earth. So it always looks stationary from your point of view. Really, really important orbit to connect the planet. All you need is three satellites to connect the entire planet um, with a constellation. So very precise orbits we've been using over the past six decades, and we're about to use them even more with thousands and thousands more satellites being launched into orbit. So we're not talking a even distribution of debris. These are concentrated highways in orbit, and they're full of litter. So next slide, please. Who is Astroscale? Why are we here? Well, we have a vision 
to keep space safe and sustainable for the development of space for the future, benefit for the future generations. That's you and the generation after you and so on, because that's what sustainability really means. And that's what it means down here on earth. Are our actions today going to negatively affect the ability for our future generations to enjoy and to use space in commerce or for defense purposes or for security purposes. So what are we doing about this? And why is Astroscale a company uh, in this business? Well, just like it is, is here on earth, sustainability is big business. We're seeing the interest in sustainability growing. We're seeing investment as I'm sure Rubicon is as well. So this is an important topic to get a handle of and to see if there's an additional value and economics we can bring to the space community. Next slide, please. So easy to say it, how do we actually do it? This is the tricky part. Uh, and you are here to uh, get the, the, the secrets, secret sauce for how do we keep space more uh, sustainable. So we believe there are three major items we have to tackle to do this. First is the technology. We have to build some sort of technology that allows satellites to quickly deorbit out of space after their lives are done. We need to be able to track those small pieces of debris and the large pieces of debris and predict where they're going to be in the, in the future so we don't run into them. But that's not all. In fact, that might be the easiest part of this problem. Policy, and by policy, I mean, what are the decisions made by governments and by industry in how they behave in space and what are the rules? And so policy has not really been set in this new era of thousands and thousands of more satellites in space piled on top of a congested space orbit. So we need to work together with other companies, with governments around the world to open the doors for policies, regulations, best practices, standards, anything that will drive us forward towards a sustainable space future. Last but certainly not least, and a very important piece of this, is the economics piece. There's been no negative consequences so far with leaving your space junk in orbit. There's no fines, like you see, the litter, $500 for littering. So we, we need to change the economics here. There needs to be fiscal incentives, financial incentives for operators, for end users. So we, we know that there is a value to clean space. And next slide, please. So Astroscale formed in 2013 by Nobu Okada, who was mentioned before, with a vision to keep space sustainable and to make a business out of it, uh, started and started in Singapore actually, and then recently has transferred to Japan. And so we have an Astroscale Japan unit, we have an Astroscale UK unit in Harwell, and we have an Astroscale US unit for which I belong. And Astroscale US has an Astroscale Israel unit. So we are truly global. And that's what's going to take. We need a global a solution to a global problem. Uh, actually, this is already out of date. We have almost 300 team members. Um, we've raised over $300 million in investment and multiple, multiple awards. Uh, but in, very importantly, our four mission lines are end of life servicing that is, I talked to you about those satellites that might go defunct or they might stop operating in space. We ask them to put something like a tow hitch on the side of their satellite. It's a flat plate and it's made of a ferrous material. And we have a servicer satellite, just like a tow truck coming up and we can attach to it with a magnet and then deorbit that safely. That's end of life. The satellite is prepared to be deorbited or prepared to be moved. Active debris removal is another mission line that we do. Now, these are objects 
that are large enough for us to collect, we cannot pick up paint chips, unfortunately, or wrenches. They have to be large enough. We wanna prevent the large debris from becoming small pieces of debris. And so large debris requires a different solution set, but the approach to that piece of debris is the same as an end of life service. So there's a lot of overlap in technology here. In situ space situational awareness, ISSA. What is this? Well, think about it. If you're gonna approach another satellite in orbit, you better know the state of that object. You better be careful. And in order to do that, you have to have sensors on your satellite. So that's what we, we can do as well. We can help inspect a satellite. Is, did something break off? Why isn't it working? What is its state? Is it spinning? You know, all sorts of information we can um, glean from, from that situation. And last but not least, Astroscale has a mission on life extension. We're not just about taking out the trash. We're about extending the lives of satellites that can be extended. For example, that important geostationary belt I talked about earlier, there are very, very expensive satellites up there. And typically they just run out of fuel. That's all that is wrong with them. What if we can go up and put a little fuel package on the side of it and take care of it for a few extra years? That's providing additional value. We wanna to get to that state where satellite operators, they have a choice. I don't have to deorbit my satellite yet. I can call in Astroscale to help me out. So that's what we're going for. Next slide, please. Oh, I already went through this. <laughs> so uh, the last one I wanna talk about is refueling and maintenance. And so this is a step beyond just that, that fuel pack, but this is like, what if we can just add capability to a satellite? What if we can maintain and, and tinker with you know, oh, okay, you got this box is not working. We'll switch it out for another one. This is this is taking the logistics of that we enjoy here on Earth and just bring it up into space, and and that will turn the space economy on its head. It will really help enable us to launch more, operate safely in orbit, and you and I benefit from those services. Next slide. Okay. Well, we're gonna talk about the market here because I told you the economics is vital for this to thrive. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start big. What is the satellite industry? So in every year, uh, the Satellite Industry Association uh, helped by Bryce Technologies puts, puts out this really good um, summary of what is in the space industry. Now, I want to point out there is no government spending on this slide. That's another bucket. But of just private spend, private revenues, companies um, deriving and doing services and driving value is worth $270 billion, global revenues. What I want to point out here is a lot of this has nothing to do with, um, you know, you have the space segment, and you have the ground segment, there's a whole chunk of market that is dedicated to the ground segment. Because satellites need to send their signals down, we need to receive those, we need to use those and, and um, leverage the data and off we go. So you can see here that $135 billion, well, pretty much half, is about the ground. And about $120 billion is about the service, not the making of the satellite, but the service that is derived from that. And a lot of that is the, the broadcast world. So the internet world is still a small slice of this, but it's growing. And the other thing I wanna point out here is the launch community is the number one thing you probably think about when I say space, it's growing. You're like, yeah, all those launches, right? Well, that's worth $5 billion. 2% of the entire global uh, space market is, is launch. A critical segment, mind you. But it tells you that just because it's small uh, doesn't mean it's not a very, very critical piece of the pathway to space. Next slide. So 
luckily, we're starting to pay attention to this issue. Uh, the government is paying attention to the issue. The public is paying attention to the issue. They are starting to understand where space helps us here on Earth. They're starting to understand we've polluted space for the last six decades, and now it's time to do something about it. So whenever you see uh, media reports like this, that's great. Let's get on to the next stage, which is going to be the environment management piece of space. Next slide. So a bit of a, an eyesore here, <laughs> sorry, or eye chart rather. I, I talked about that $270 billion market in 2020. Where is it going? And I didn't talk about any private space flight. I didn't talk about honor with services. I didn't talk about going to the moon and opening a lunar base. That is all coming. That's, and that's going to be enabled by these on orbit services. You don't need to bring, you know, launch something every time you need a new wrench. You can make it in orbit. You can have someone deliver it. So they, the space market is estimated to grow from one to three billion dollars, or sorry, trillion, T, trillion dollars between now and 2040 massive. There's a lot of potential here. That's why I say it's congested, uh, but there's a lot of potential if we do this right. Uh, the honor with services, which isn't even in that chart I showed you before, that's going to be an approximate $25 billion market over the next uh, few decades. So a really important market to be in for space sustainability and for providing just everyday services to those satellites. Next slide, please. So Astroscale is not a just talk the talk kind of company. We walk the walk as well. We have funded our own demonstration in orbit to show an end of life servicer and to show the world how this could work and, our, and the operators up there. So LCD, end of life services by Astroscale demonstration was launched in March, and it uh, went up in March. We have a ground station in the UK. Uh, it was built in Japan. Talk about hard policy problems. How do you get all this licensed? Uh, and it's demonstrating the technologies that are going to be required for that debris removal service. Rendezvous, diagnose the satellite, synchronize the orbits and in in, in where it is, uh, to line up with it, capture it, stabilize it, and finally deorbit. So you'll see us in the press quite a bit. Here's a sampling of those um, those uh, uh, media outlets that are interested, and the public's obviously interested in this as well. Next slide, please. So what do we got to do next? Well, join us for one. <laughs> join us in understanding the issue, but also telling your friends and family, your professors, you're, you're part of the community already with Clear Constellation. So welcome, welcome to the S Space Sustainability Club. Um, but here's a sampling of companies that believe in sustainability in space. And some of them uh, are part of a consortium, a trade association, if you will. Um, called CONFERS. It's the Consortium for the Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing. And that consortium comes up with ideas for rules, as I, as I was saying before, standards, and really advocacy for the on orbit servicing community. But there's plenty of other uh, companies out there that believe this is an urgent problem, and they want to do something about it now. So next slide, please. So where do you fit in? Well, you already fit in. You're now in the club. Welcome. Uh, but we want to see you thrive in this ecosystem as well and in this economy and, and go out and explore, ask questions of the company that you're looking to get hired from. Say, hey, what, what are your sustainability practices in orbit and on Earth? You know, it's time we ask these questions. It's time that uh, financial institutions ask these questions. It's time that they get identified in the ESGs of a company. 
So you have a role here to play for sure. And the other point I want to make is when I grew up anyway, uh, someone said, oh, you want to go to space? Um, that means you have to be an astronaut and an engineer, and that's it. <laughs> that is no longer true. As I told you, the economics of this, we need entrepreneurs, we need business majors, we need communications folks. I told you about this is a big public messaging thing as well. Um, you need policy wonks, lawyers. I can't tell you how many lawyers we, <laughs> we need on, on various projects. Lots of room for lawyers here. Um, and of course, we need lots and lots of engineers and, and STEM qualified folks too. But all of you fit and all of you matter in this space. So I will leave it there. I've talked enough. I want to hear what you have to think, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, uh, Charity. That was fascinating stuff, and I uh, really appreciate that um, comprehensive uh, presentation there. Um, so to everybody who's who's watching, this is uh, we're going to start the Q&A period now. So if you have um, any uh, any questions you'd like to submit to us, please use the Q&A box to do so. We've actually already got a bunch uh, that, that have come in, so I'm going to tick through a few of these. Uh, charity. So um, just to start off with a, a kind of like a level setting kind of a, a, a question, like Project Clear Constellation exists to confront this this issue of space debris as does AstroScale. Um, again, just to kind of set the table, like we all know there's a space debris issue, but but how bad is it really? And and what are the concomitant risks of this of this issue as it grows? That's a really tough question. Because if nothing happens, people will say, oh, it's OK. And if something happens, people are like, ah, oh, the sky's falling. So <laughs> somewhere in the middle, I would say, uh, it, you know, I would much rather be active and do something about the issue before we have a cataclysmic um, cascading event, the Kessler syndrome. We cannot get to that point. A million pieces of lethal non-trackable debris and 130 million smaller than one centimeter, which also do damage. We're at that point. And I'm okay if people you know, later on say, ah, it was nothing. But as long as we've done our job, that's okay. Uh, you cannot prove a negative. So time is now, and it's not in three years, it's not in five years. We almost doubled, we have doubled the number of operational satellites in orbit in the last two years alone. That's it. It's going to cascade from there. It's going to exponentially grow. There's plans for over 100,000 satellites. And that's just not like I'm going to launch 100,000 100, satellites and then, okay, I'm done. It's like constant up and down. If you can just consider everything rotating, sorry, my hands on my screen everything orbiting and then the on ramps and the off ramps going up going down and the going down mm. part is a lot slower than the going up in the on orbit part so we need to figure this out we have no traffic system in space this is a time to do it now it's urgent okay so that's actually that's a, a great segue into a question that came in from andrew at cu boulder um what kind of challenges have you experienced working with policymakers or decision makers when it comes to getting them to care about space debris, especially considering all of the other things that are constantly happening in the world. I assume Andrew means, you know, geopolitical situations, shifting tides, and obviously what's happening right now. Uh, in Ukraine, for example, that's obviously demands and deserves uh, the attention of, uh, of, our, of our government and, and the policymakers within it. Um, but um, aside from that, what, are, what other challenges uh, have you, do you encounter in that regard? So there's kind of three phases I assess when I talk to a, uh, a decision maker. Do they acknowledge that there's an issue? Mm -hmm. Do they accept that there's an issue? Yeah. And are they driven to do something about it? Will they take action? So mm -hmm. when it comes to acknowledging there's an issue, that's an educational opportunity for us to go in and give this briefing to them uh, and to, to provide additional materials and, and you know, studies and academia. Uh, so it's an education issue and we try to cover, not just us, but there's plenty of non-government organizations, Secure World is in, in Colorado, I'm sure Andrew knows. 
uh, and other companies going in talking about this issue. That's the acknowledged piece. Acceptance, this is where we need data. We need hard data. We need CU Boulder to come and prepared with the information, the data, you know, work together. Let's go talk to our decision makers, show them the charts, show them what's going on, showing them in you know, the probabilities and all the all the issues, the economics, the policy and the and the um, technology issues along with this. So to get them to accept, yes, OK, the data is out there. I'm now understanding and uh, acknowledging of that issue. And then we have to drive them to action. So we need to come prepared. Here's what I want you to do about it. Uh, I, it's a lot easier getting decision makers to take action when you have some options for them. So that's what we're doing right now. It's like, okay, here are some ideas that we can implement in legislation. Have you thought about adding this to a new policy, a governmental policy? Um, we go to the FCC, which right now has a rulemaking on debris. Have you thought about this? We would like you to, to apply this as a regulation. And we line them up and we get coalitions together to do the same. So there's things we can do to drive through to action. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm seeing, I don't have to educate decision makers much anymore on this. They know it's an issue and they mm. care about it because all their constituents, national security, safety, economics and commerce are all related to space. Space is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. You can't get away from it anymore. So no matter who you are, you have a reason to go talk to your uh, representative uh, to tell them about the issue and to demand action. Got it. That's great. Okay. So continuing on the, the policy um, question, just to kind of um, just add a, add a layer here. Um, could you speak to the, the different roles of different federal entities, such as the U.S. Space Force, um, the National Space Council, NASA, um, and if there are any sort of uh, um, pressing initiatives or any uh, key pieces of legislation that they are championing that could contribute to the, the solution to space debris? Awesome. Policy 101. Love it. Um, so, so let's split it into the legislative branch and the executive branch. We'll start with the executive. How about that? The, you have regulators in the executive branch, and then you have policy decision makers, those that are influential. The regulators are the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, NOAA, that which is under Department of Commerce, who regulates commercial remote sensing, but they still do the check in the box for debris mitigation. The FAA, which regulates, regulates all launches, and they do a check in the box, you know, will this um, will this uh, cause undue, you know, harm to, you know, bypassers here on the ground if 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 a launch provider uh, or if a launch goes awry? But also they they want to know about the debris issue as well. And then you have State Department. Uh, when we are building satellites and and passing data of, or information around the world, the State Department uh, is a regulator for information that should not be released to certain countries. So this is uh, export control is what I'm talking about here. And there's a munitions list that the State Department manages. And on that list is rockets. And on that list are honored services and other elements of satellites. Uh, so, so sometimes we need to go to the State Department to get permission to share information with our colleagues. The Department of Commerce, back to the Department of Commerce, um, they also have a export control list, uh, but it's a, it's a commerce list. So you'd have to go okay. to them too. So, so I, I'm telling you but only about the regulators here. And then you have State Department who is going to do the international relations piece. You have, I haven't even talked about NASA yet, right? NASA has a huge role here in fielding these technologies that are so critical um, at a very early stage and moving them through a, a demonstration of some sort. So NASA is important here. I'm probably going to miss a whole bunch. DOD has a huge, huge role and influence in what happens in space. The 18th Space Control Squadron 
actually does that space situation awareness piece for the rest of the world and for the commercial community. And that's being transferred over to the Department of Commerce. And of course, on top of all of this is the White House and the National Space Council that kind of collates these multi or interagency discussions. They kind of thread it all together for one, one policy kind of thing. And then you have mm -hmm. the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and you have the National Security Council. So yeah, lots of folks over here. Legislative side, there are specific committees that oversee these executive branch uh, agencies, and they write authorizations almost every year and appropriate them. So they dole out the funds. And so uh, it uh, behooves us to make sure that they're well-informed and understand the issue and that they're um, um, resourcing the agencies to the level that's needed to, to deal with this issue. Okay, good. That's a five-minute yeah, one-on-one that, policy briefing. That's quite the uh, quite the soup of uh, of titles there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I wanted to just get to a, a few more questions. Um, so Victoria, um, also from Colorado, um, it says Colorado School. I think it says Colorado School of Mining. I think is is where oh, uh, Victoria is from. Um, do you know of any solutions to the debris issue that had potential at first, that looked great at first, but was subsequently discarded for whatever reason? Well, the community has not tried a lot yet. So mm -hmm. things that have worked but haven't been passed along as lessons, a lot of there have been rendezvous and proximity operations where two objects um, not collide, but come together in a safe manner by government missions. Uh, NASA's done this, DOD has done this, but those lessons have not seeped out of the government community into the industry. So we've developed those own technologies ourselves. So that's one thing that wasn't passed on that could can or could help. Um, and then a few years ago, to be honest, anything we try is worth it. Okay, so, so I, I mean, there's legitimate limits, of course, to that. But th we need to get out there and do stuff and demonstrate it. So I, I would never, um, you know, have a negative voice on. Okay, that was a that was a dumb idea. Nah, no, mm -hmm. there are all all object, uh, I, you know, all options on the table, sort of thing. I do know of uh, previous attempts to capture debris with uh, a net. A harpoon um, and with lasers and the lasers would work on very small pieces of debris the lasers are not in space they'd be mm -hmm. on earth and and just that little photon of light is enough to push the orbit or perturbate the orbit and and cause it to slowly uh, descend uh, oh. so all of them have been all of these three three things I believe have been tried I'm not so sure about the lace, but I know about the, the net and a harpoon. I can see um, why a harpoon might not be the right technology for some applications. So um, a, a rocket stage, like, you know, what if it has fuel in it, that sort of thing. And how do tethers work in space? Tethers are another way. So I think all the technologies should be evaluated, uh, tested, and demonstrated and, and we should find a suite of solutions for the range of debris that is up there. Yeah, the, the harpoon one is, is, you know, is interesting. I mean, it sounds like it might actually contribute to potentially more debris, right? Because with, with the impact, there would be some damage, one would assume, right? So what if those pieces were to come apart and then you've kind of compounded the, the problem, I yeah. guess? Yeah, yeah. Um, one does okay, on one does the, not want to create debris in the effort of removing debris. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, moving on to another um, question that's, that's actually kind of related to what we just talked about. Um, the uh, John uh, Rasset, I, I hope I'm saying your name right correctly, John, from New Mexico Tech. Um, what do you think of the debris creating potential of anti-satellite weapons? Mm. Should anti-satellite satellite weaponry be banned internationally because of the threat they pose? from space debris creation? I'll say this, any purposeful creation of debris in space is bad. 
So that an ASAT test, a kinetic ASAT test uh, that purposely goes up and destroys another satellite, it's, it's bad for the economy. It's bad for uh, investment, right? Do investors really um, feel confident after uh, actions like that in space where they're putting pouring billions of dollars? And it, it's, it's just, it's bad for geopolitics too. Um, we need space. We need space to be clean and we need space to benefit from the many services. All of us around the world use space, by the way. So <laughs> I have no eloquent way of saying this, but you're, <laughs> you're, you're doing damage to yourself when you yeah. are creating an, uh, a debris cloud of, of, um, of debris rather in space yeah. uh, because your, your own satellites will suffer and your own humans will be dodging that debris and, and yeah. that's not good for anyone. So that's all I'll say. Right. As, as, a, yes. yeah, as, a, as a shared space, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, moving on. Uh, Joseph Johnson from Embry Riddle. Thank you for your question. How do you motivate companies and their engineers to sacrifice precious satellite resources, such as mass and/or volume, so that they can implement implement deorbiting, refueling, SSA systems, and so on? Mm. I am going to go on record as saying I don't understand that question, but I bet Joseph does, and I bet you do. So I'll, I'll pass it over. Yeah, to no, it's a, a familiar question and something we struggle with. Um, so industry needs to step up here, and as I was talking about before, there is a cost. There's a cost to doing nothing, and there's a cost to doing something question is, how do you balance those costs? And it's not just about you. It's about your orbital neighbors. So you have to worry about their cost trade balance as well. So when we, this is the, just a great example of why global commons uh, issues like, like uh, space debris is so hard to solve is because, well, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to add weight to my satellite and, and deorbit it early, uh, you know, just because, you know, someone else did an ASAT test, that's not fair to me. Yeah, but you're in the soup. You are in there and you are, you're going to either contribute to the problem or alleviate the problem. So which one, which do you want to be part of? So I think about this in three ways. One is peer pressure. There are many companies trying to do the same thing in orbit. Constellations for remote sensing, constellations for broadband internet. Uh, you name it, there's, they're, they're competing against terrestrial companies as well. How do you distinguish yourself in this day and age when sustainability is a really important matter for your business and to attract talent? Let's face it, I love our, our young millennials and Gen Zers um, they care about this issue and they, they will tell you <laughs> that they care about it. So, so peer pressure, uh, is, is, is a, a good thing here. Um, best practices coming together for voluntary measures. Okay. And then there's the economic pressure I was talking about. Uh, we have the power of our purse. Do I choose this internet provider or this internet provider? Well, let me dig in, show me your ESG goals. And how does that relate to space debris? Um, and, and governments have a choice here too. Uh, you know, they can write in the requirement easily with a stroke of a pen. Thou shalt do A, B, and C. And that, that would be attached to a contract. So we, I mean, we can drive that, that pattern. And then of course, the last uh, way of, of, you know, encouraging industry to go the right direction is regulatory pressure which um, one does not want to go overboard on because we don't want to regulate ourselves out of business and out of this great expansion into our solar system. But we do need to have a floor of what is minimal for you to do in space. And just think about the peer pressure about this is the ceiling and the regulations are the floor. So that's, those are the way I think about it. And I ask myself, which one of these uh, items is most uh, effective for the company I'm talking to. 
Great, great. Okay, so I think we've got time for for one more question, and I want to circle back to um, um, a comment that you made towards the end of your presentation, Charity, which is around careers in in space. So. You know, intuitively, when, when people think of careers in the space industry, they typically think of STEM roles, you know, technology and um, science and, and engineering and, and those kinds of roles. But as the industry grows, um, what other opportunities past those kinds of STEM roles could we think about? Um, and, um, and how do, do we think sort of space policy plays into the evolution of those kinds of roles within the industry? Mm. So many pathways to uh, a space career, I do recommend understanding the, the, the environment itself. So basics of, and you don't need to have a degree in this, but no orbital mechanics, no, know how things orbit the earth and the solar system and just the, the speeds and just kind of understand that. So you know that the whole Star Wars kind of <laughs> going up to next to a ship, it, that's not a thing. Um, rendezvous and proximity operations is, highly complex because uh, you're both spinning around and you have to match each other. So that's important to know. Uh, but beyond some, some very baseline items uh, to know technically, the sky's the limit. So if you can imagine it and if you're passionate about it, there is a space hook somewhere. If you are an artist or a songwriter or w filmmaker, I can I can come up with ways that you can bring space into your life, right? So uh, I took a non-traditional path. I joined the military. <laughs> um, and by the way, this is not a recruitment tool, but there is a whole branch dedicated to space in the Department of Defense. So, hey, mm -hmm. there's that path as well uh, and, and all sorts of paths. So I would take a, a look at the entirety of the space industry, what companies excite you, uh, what, where are they in their space journey? Did they just start? Because if they just start, they need creatives. They need folks that can do a little of everything, willing to just get their hands dirty. That might be something you like. Or are they very mature and, and have processes already and have structure to that? That might be better for you as well. You have a lot of choice here. Uh, and then you have government as well. I would not discount government. We need good, well-informed regulators. We need uh, those that, that do the paperwork for licensing and go out to the launch sites and make sure things are safe. You know, there's a whole range of important jobs uh, in the government and, and my hat's off to anyone in the government that um, is in, this, in the space ecosystem, the space community, because they, they work tireless hours in such a dynamic, dynamic um, environment or ecosystem. So I don't know if that answers your question. It just totally depends. Catch me afterwards or send me an email and we can talk about your specific interests and where where you're sort of looking to to enter. Oh, sorry about that. Um, enter the space industry. Uh, but but there's the sky's your limit. We need you as the other thing. We will not get to a trillion dollar space economy on the current numbers right now in the in in the space community we need a lot more people so be creative don't take no for an answer <laughs> go in there tell them what your worth is what you can do um you know if they if they don't see the vision then move on to the next one i'm sure those that are smart will will snap you up right away well, I think that's just uh, what what better way to to close out today's session than than that message. Thank you, Charity, and uh, a, a great message to leave everybody who's watching today with as well, who have aspirations uh, in the space industry. So, um, all that remains really is for me to thank you again. Thank you to everybody who has joined, and thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them. Um, just a quick pitch for our next Clear Constellation Roundtable, which will be on Tuesday, April twelfth again at 12, uh, sorry, at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, at which time we will feature Steve Lee, who is a program manager at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the AIAA, and he will be speaking with Dr. Ruth Stilwell, who is Executive Director of Aerospace Policy Solutions and serves as a visiting scholar to the Space Policy Institute at GW University. They will talk more about the issue of space de uh, debris and also of space traffic management. So again, thank you to Charity and thank you to all for joining.
and hopefully we'll see you all again in April. Thank you. Good luck, everyone.